picture this. It's the 22nd of June, 1989, and pouring with rain. Welcome to British summertime. And I'm walking through the streets of London. No, I'm marching through the streets of London, calling for all zoos to be closed. I passionately believed that animals belonged in the wild, happy and free. They did not belong in zoos. I wanted to be like my hero, Jane Goodall, and go to Africa and live and work with chimpanzees in the wild. I was passionate, pink-haired and placard-waving. Everything was black and white. How on earth then, 30 years later, do I find myself walking through the steps of Buckingham Palace to collect an OBE for running a zoo? What on earth happened? Let me tell you, I learned lots of stuff over those 25, 30 years and what I learned shocked me, upset me and I changed my mind. And I'm not ashamed to say that I changed my mind. Let me take you on my journey. I guess it probably began at school. I was really into monkeys and all animals and apes like us. So I read all the books in the school library, all about monkeys, all about apes. And eventually I got to the books by Jane Goodall. The blonde young woman that went to Africa to live with chimpanzees in the 60s, my hero. I wanted to be her when I grew up. Can you imagine my excitement then, when as a 15-year-old, I met Jane Goodall for the first time? I went up to her excitedly saying, I'm going to be a vet. And she said, wisely, heroes are always wise. She said, great, we need more vets in conservation. <sighs> my hero spoke. My life was set. That's what I would do for the rest of my life. I would be a vet and I would save the planet and I would save animals. So let me tell you about my passion for animals. These are all the great apes. This is your family tree. So let me introduce you to your closest cousins. First, we've got the red ape, the only solitary ape and the only one that lives outside Africa, the orangutan. They have a very long childhood and they have very long memories. They can think and plan we think days, weeks, even months and years ahead while they navigate the forest and arrive just in time on the right day when fruit uh, is going to appear on the trees. Really clever animals. Then the gorilla, you're probably familiar with those, the big hairy silverback sitting, guarding his family, munching on leaves and belching in the rainforest just waiting for David Attenborough to turn up with his film crew. <laughs> and then you've got the chimpanzees. My favourite, loud, noisy, boisterous, competitive, aggressive. Can you see why I love them? <laughs> well, they're great. And then we come to another one, the bonobo. Have you even heard about them yet? Not gazebo, that's a tent for your garden. These are bonobo. When they were discovered at the turn of the century, we thought they were the missing link. They were actually confused with early humans. In fact, even in the 1920s, we thought they might be like humans, and perhaps humans should be reclassified as a type of bonobo. And what especially fascinates me about bonobos is that they're the only ape that is female-led. The females lead their whole group. And what's also interesting about bonobo is that they don't resolve conflict with fighting and scrapping and biting like chimpanzees, but they resolve conflict by kissing and hugging. Maybe we should all be a bit more bonobo. And then I got to meet my hero again, and this time we're dressing the same. <laughs> so we met for a coffee and a flapjack in London, and we talked about the meaning of life and the problems of the world, and for me everything was still black and white. Animals are good, zoos are bad. What are we going to do to solve the extinction crisis on the planet? And what she said to me then really shocked me, surprised me, and upset me quite a bit. What she said to me was, I think I'd rather be a chimp in a good zoo right now than in the wild. Really? Really? 
my hero who taught me everything I know about chimpanzees who I'd looked up to and had started to dress like by accident was saying perhaps chimps could be better off in a good zoo than in the wild. I, I didn't like this. I had to think about it. I didn't know what that meant for the rest of my life. And eventually I got to go to Africa and see with my own eyes what it was actually like for chimpanzees and gorillas. And I saw that they were being slaughtered, their families were being slaughtered, and the lucky ones, if they were young kids and they were sold either into the pet trade or just kept by the poachers' kids for a while, if they were lucky, they'd be rescued and confiscated and be put into rescue centres. And they'd probably live out the rest of their lives in those rescue centres, never seeing the wild again. And these wires were as much to keep the animals in as to keep the poachers out. This was not like the BBC documentaries I'd grown up watching. This isn't the wild I wanted to see. This isn't the wild I thought was out there. What was I going to do? Well, I carried on being a zoo and wildlife vet internationally, flying around Europe and America and giving lectures here and there and writing diverse papers such as tortoise heart disease. It exists. Look it up. Um, and gorilla cataracts. And doing health checks on big guys like this. That's me. But, and I'm a slow thinker, after 25 years I thought, maybe she's got a point. Maybe I need to do more. Maybe I can do more and I should do more. I want us to start thinking about zoos like we think about hospitals. You might not love them, but we need them. We will get sick, we may get poorly, we will need hospitals. You don't close all the hospitals because there's a bad one. You improve it. But we do need them. Do we need zoos? Well, I believe we do. Because we're in an extinction crisis right now. Wouldn't it have been great if somebody 25, 30 years ago, before it got this bad, would have thought, do you know what? We need an ark on the planet. We need to start breeding animals in safe spaces so that if and when the human race wakes up and it's safe, we can re-release them. It would have been great if somebody had done that. And the fantastic news is, we did. Some of us humans did do that, and those arcs are called zoos. For the last 25 to 30 years, zoos have been managing these animals using geneticists and computer programs that I don't really understand, but to make sure that we will have these animals still on the planet, even if they go extinct in the wild. Is that what I want? Is that the best solution? No, I'd rather the, they were all happy and wild and free, but we have a problem right now. So we need many solutions and it's not black and white. We don't live in a sci-fi movie. The last time we had an extinction crisis, these guys went because a great big meteorite fell out the sky. There's no meteorite this time. We're in the sixth great extinction crisis because we humans have caused it. We humans are melting the polar ice caps, we're chopping down the forests, we're driving our closest cousins to extinction. Shame on us. We're the evolved ape. If we're part of the problem, we can come up with the solutions. We can, and we will, and we are. Let me tell you something else about dinosaurs as well. We're not bringing them back. You can't really clone them back out of amber and grow them in a laboratory and stick them back out wild and free. And so we're not going to do that with wild animals either. We need to step up to the plate. The problem is now, the sixth extinction crisis is going on now. We need to stop these animals going extinct. And that's why, and that's why we do need zoos. They're the ark right now. They're keeping the species going on the planet while we wake up. They're buying us time. Let me tell you a bit more about the female-led bonobos and why they're going extinct on our planet right now. Mobile phones. There are 7 billion people on the planet right now, and there are 7 billion mobile phones. One for each and every one of us. 7 billion! That is a huge number. What's interesting, and I didn't know this, what's interesting about mobile phones is that they've got this magic stuff in it called coltan. 
And coltan is a thing that makes electronics smaller and portable. So we needed coltan to invent mobile phones. Every single mobile phone circulating on the planet, 7 billion of them, has coltan in it. So coltan has to be dug out of the ground. We don't make it. <coughs> coltan is under the ground in the rainforests. 85% of the world's supply of coltan is in the Congo rainforest. And the Congo rainforest is the only place on earth where wild bonobos live. You see where I'm going. What we've done in my lifetime, since I was marching as a pink hair placard waving student, we've destroyed 90% of their home. 90% of bonobos in the wild have been wiped out because we've got these gadget things. No one asked me. I love gadgets. I've had loads of them and I love apes. And it's taken me, shamefully, 25, 30 years to put two and two together. But now I know, and now you know, what we're going to do about it. Oh, it's only one more mobile phone, said seven billion people. Hold on to that thought. I want to tell you about another problem that apes are facing. Palm oil and orangutans. I met my wife arguing about palm oil because, you know, to me, the world was still black and white. Palm oil kills orangutans and she hated zoos and they should all be shut. Sound familiar? But what she told me and taught me was about sustainable palm oil. It's a bit complicated, but, you know, we're the evolved apes with the big brains, so I'm going to take you on it. Bear with me. Palm oil used to grow in Africa. And then somebody somewhere realised it was a good crop and it would grow anywhere hot. So about 100 years ago, they transplanted it to Indonesia. Indonesia is the only place on earth where wild orangutans live. So to plant this palm oil, they cut down a bit of forest and a bit more and a bit more. And palm oil is amazing stuff. It makes soap better. It makes food last longer. It's stable at room temperature and high temperatures. It's odourless and tasteless. Fantastic. So everybody found out how fantastic it was and it's ended up in 50% of the packaged stuff we get in supermarkets has palm oil in it. It's throughout our food chain already. So surely, simply, black and white issue, this is awful, we're knocking down the forest, we're driving orangutans to extinction, stop buying it. There's seven billion people, there's seven billion of us, let's tell the big bad corporates, job done, problem solved. And the problem is, it isn't that simple, it isn't a black and white issue anymore. 90% of the forests have gone. If we switch now to a different oil in all that food stuff, we'll knock down even more forests. The other oils need 10 times as much forest to be destroyed for the same litre of oil. Ugh. I want the world to be black and white. Ban this, ban that. Pro this, anti that. And it's really not. We have to promote now sustainable palm oil. The sustainable palm oil programme means the forests are still standing, the workers are paid well so they don't go hunting, and the animals are protected. We've already let the genie out of the bottle. Complex issues now need complex and complicated solutions sometimes, and we have to think that through. If we make it a black and white issue, we can sometimes make the problem even worse. We live on a single planet. One of the problems is there's seven billion of us. So one solution is less humans. Not going there right now. <laughs> the other solution is more planets. Also the subject of a different talk. No, what we need to do is take care of our finite resources. Didn't the inventors of mobile phones know that we were going to need seven billion? Well, they didn't. Famously, IBM, when it invented computers, said in the 1940s, hmm, these computer things, really important. We think for the whole planet, we'll probably need five. <laughs> 
So yeah, future-proofing is difficult. It's hard for us to think ahead. We probably need to be a bit more orangutan and plan months, years, and in our case, probably centuries ahead. We have to start doing that. We live on a finite planet with finite resources, and it is not good enough that these animals are going to go extinct in my lifetime. So the pink hair has gone, but not the passion. I'm a little less angry. But I think if I was meeting my 20-year-old self now, my banner would probably look a bit more like this. We need zoos. I don't think that's great, but we do. They're like hospitals. We need the arcs. We need to stop these animals going extinct. It's not the only solution. We need to keep the trees standing. We'll just plant more trees, I hear you say. Well, did you know that when we plant trees now, it will take 200 to 500 years to mature that forest so that it can support gorillas and orangutans again? So we can start planting, and we should, but we may have a gap, and that's where the arcs and the zoos come in. So that's my journey. That's how I changed my mind. These issues are complicated and complex, and it's not black and white anymore. What do I want? I want the opportunity sometime, not too many years from now, to be able to sit down with a pink-haired, passionate, animal-loving student and be able to say, hand on heart, it's safe now. The chimps are better off in the wild. Thank you.